Good evening and welcome back to Northanger Abbey. Thank you for your comments and likes so far. It means a lot and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Chapter 5 Catherine was not so much engaged at the theatre that evening in returning the nods and smiles of Miss Thorpe, though they certainly claimed much of her leisure, as to forget to look with an inquiring eye for Mr Tilney in every box which her eye could reach. But she looked in vain. Mr Tilney was no fonder of the play than the pump room. She hoped to be more fortunate the next day, and when her wishes for fine weather were answered by seeing a beautiful morning, she hardly felt a doubt of it. For a fine Sunday in Bath empties every house of its inhabitants, and all the world appears on such an occasion to walk about and tell their acquaintance what a charming day it is. As soon as the divine service was over, the Thorpes and Allens eagerly joined each other, and after staying long enough in the pump room to discover that the crowd was insupportable, and that there was not a genteel face to be seen, which everybody discovers every Sunday throughout the season, they hastened away to the crescent to breathe the fresh air of better company. Here Catherine and Isabella, arm in arm, again tasted the sweets of friendship in an unreserved conversation. They talked much and with much enjoyment, but again was Catherine disappointed in her hope of re-seeing her partner. He was nowhere to be met with. Every search for him was equally unsuccessful, in morning lounges or evening assemblies, neither at the upper nor lower rooms. At dressed or undressed balls was he perceivable, nor among the walkers, the horsemen, the curricle drivers of the morning. His name was not in the pump room book, and curiosity could do no more. He must be gone from Bath. Yet he had not mentioned that his stay would be so short. This sort of mysteriousness, which is always so becoming in a hero, threw a fresh grace in Catherine's imagination around his person and manners, and increased her anxiety to know more of him. From the Thorpe she could learn nothing, for they had only been in Bath two days before they met with Mrs Allen. It was a subject, however, in which she often indulged with her fair friend, from whom she received every possible encouragement to continue to think of him, and his impression on her fancy was not suffered, therefore, to weaken. Isabella was very sure that he must be a charming young man, and was equally sure that he must have been delighted with her dear Catherine, and would therefore shortly return. She liked him the better for being a clergyman, for she must confess herself very partial to the profession, and something like a sigh escaped her as she said it. Perhaps Catherine was wrong in not demanding the cause of that gentle emotion, but she was not experienced enough in the finesse of love or the duties of friendship to know when delicate raillery was properly called for or when a confidence should be forced. Mrs Allen was now quite happy, quite satisfied with Bath. She had found some acquaintance, had been so lucky too as to find in them the family of a most worthy old friend, and as the completion of good fortune, had found these friends by no means so expensively dressed as herself. Her daily expressions were no longer, I wish we had some acquaintance in Bath. They were changed into, how glad I am we have met with Mrs Thorpe. And she was as eager in promoting the intercourse of the two families, as her young charge and Isabella themselves could be, never satisfied with the day unless she spent the chief of it by the side of Mrs Thorpe, in what they called conversation, but in which there was scarcely ever any exchange of opinion, and not often any resemblance of subject, for Mrs Thorpe talked chiefly of her children, and Mrs Allen of her gowns. The progress of the friendship between Catherine and Isabella was quick as its beginning had been warm, and they passed so rapidly through every gradation of increasing tenderness that there was shortly no fresh proof of it to be given to their friends or themselves. They called each other by their Christian name, were always arm in arm when they walked, pinned up each other's train for the dance, and were not to be divided in the set. And if a rainy morning deprived them of other enjoyments, they were still resolute in meeting in defiance of wet and dirt, and shut themselves up to read novels together. Yes, novels. For I will not adopt that ungenerous and impolitic custom so common with novel writers, of degrading by their contemptuous censure the very performances to the number of which they are themselves adding joining with their greatest enemies in bestowing the harshest epithets on such works, and scarcely ever permitting them to be read by their own heroine, who, if she accidentally take up a novel, is sure to turn over its insipid pages with disgust. Alas, if the heroine of one novel be not patronised by the heroine of another, 
From whom can she expect protection and regard? I cannot approve of it. Let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure, and over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash with which the press now groans. Let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. Although our productions have afforded more extensive and unaffected pleasure than those of any other literary cooperation in the world, no species of composition has been so much decried. From pride, ignorance or fashion, our foes are almost as many as our readers. And while the abilities of the 900th abridger of the history of England, or of the man who collects and publishes in a volume some dozen lines of Milton, Pope and Prior, with a paper from the Spectator and a chapter from Stern, are eulogised by a thousand pens, there seems almost a general wish of decrying the capacity and undervaluing the labour of the novelist, and of slighting the performances which have only genius, wit and taste to recommend them. I am no novel reader. I seldom look into novels. Do not imagine that I often read novels. It is really very well for a novel. Such is the common cant. And what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel, replies the young lady, while she lays down her book with affected indifference or momentary shame. It is only Cecilia, or Camilla, or Belinda, or in short only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Now, had the same young lady been engaged with the volume of the spectator, instead of such a work, how proudly would she have produced the book and told its name? Though the chances must be against her being occupied by any part of that voluminous publication, which either the matter or manner would not disgust a young person of taste, the substance of its papers so often consisting in the statement of improbable circumstances, unnatural characters, and topics of conversation, which no longer concern any one living, and their language too frequently so coarse as to give no very favourable idea of the age that could endure it. I think we'd better part pause just for a moment before reading chapter six, after that extraordinary um, digression on the subject of novels, which on one level seems a little bit out of place. Austin hasn't really introduced her theme of the book until this chapter, which is reading and novels. Um, and this extraordinary defence of the novel, as it's called, is one of the most famous elements of Northanger Abbey. Why might Austin need to defend the novel, you say? Well, I think she explains it pretty well herself there. Um, novel reading and novel writing for women was looked down upon in the late 18th century. Um, and generally, young women were chastised if they read novels because they were considered immoral. Or if they were not reading a novel that was considered immoral, as many of the Gothic novels were, then they were reading a very moralistic novel in which, you know, the heroine could only be rewarded with the love of the hero once she had repented all of, her, of all her ways. And in fact, the hero and heroine were often intolerably dull. And the interesting characters were contemned to being the villains and the anti-heroines who got away with all sorts of bad stuff, but were then not allowed a happy ending. Um, and so that was the literary culture in which Austen was writing and in which Fanny Burney was writing, in which novelists had to pretend they were doing something very trivial and were absolutely slated in the reviews. And people who liked novels, despite their great popularity, were forced to pretend that they didn't think they were very good because they were not history or um, science or poetry, which were considered great things. And the fact that most of the novel writers were women, I'm sure, has absolutely nothing to do with this. And there was a real moral panic at this period about novels and about their popularity and the influence they had on impressionable young women. And it's, I think, nothing has really changed very much because we see exactly the same thing in the moral outcry against uh, against video games and the the way they are affecting young people. And we see the same thing in the way everyone is very, very concerned about teenage girls reading Twilight, for instance, and how uh, um, morally bad it is for them and how they're going to, it's going to mean they've got, going to get terrible ideas about love and romance. And it's exactly the same purity panic about what young women are allowed to read, what young people are allowed to consume. Um, nothing much has really changed, which is very interesting. 
But that's the that's the culture in which Austen was writing and produced Northanger Abbey. And a lot of her commentary in this novel is in response to that. And she's creating a heroine who is a novel reader. And we shall see how that affects her. The, um, the heroine we've seen in Evelina, for example, very naive, um, but very virtuous. Is Catherine going to be that kind of heroine? Is she, if she goes wrong, is she going to be punished for that? Will she deserve the hero in the end? Or is that not the language we should be using in this kind of, um, story? How are the Gothic elements going to be integrated with it? What is Austen doing here? But she, for she's certainly doing something. Um, let us continue now and have some conversation between Catherine and Isabella, where we will find out a little more about their respective personalities and their views on literature and men. Because what do we like more than gossiping about books and men with our friends? Chapter 6. The following conversation, which took place between the two friends in the pump room one morning, after an acquaintance of eight or nine days, is given as a specimen of their very warm attachment, and of the delicacy, discretion, originality of thought, and literary taste which marked the reasonableness of that attachment. They met by appointment, and as Isabella had arrived nearly five minutes before her friend, her first address naturally was, "'My dearest creature, what can have made you so late? I have been waiting for you at least this age.' "'Have you indeed? I am very sorry for it, but really, I thought I was in very good time. It is but just one. I hope you have not been here long. Oh, these ten ages at least. I am sure I have been here this half hour. But now, let us go and sit down at the other end of the room and enjoy ourselves. I have a hundred things to say to you. In the first place, I was so afraid it would rain this morning just as I wanted to set off. It looked very showery and that would have thrown me into agonies. Do you know I saw the prettiest hat you can imagine in a shop window in Milsom Street just now, very like yours, only with coquelico ribbons instead of green. I quite longed for it, but my dearest Catherine, what have you been doing with yourself all this morning? Have you gone on with Udolpho? Yes, I have been reading it ever since I woke, and I am got to the Black Veil. Are you indeed? How delightful! Oh, I would not tell you what is behind the Black Veil for the world. Are you wild to know? Oh yes, quite. What can it be? But do not tell me. I would not be told on any account. I know it must be a skeleton. I am sure it is Laurentina's skeleton. Oh, I am delighted with the book. I should like to spend my whole life in reading it. I assure you, if it had not been to meet with you, I would not have come away from it for all the world. Dear creature, how much I am obliged to you. And when you have finished Udolpho, we will read the Italian together and I have made out a list of ten or twelve more of the same kind for you. Have you indeed? How glad I am. What are they all? I will read you their names directly. Here they are in my pocket book. Castle of Wolfenbach, Claremont, Mysterious Warnings, Necromancer of the Black Forest, Midnight Bell, Orphan of the Rhine, and Horrid Mysteries. These will last us some time. Yes, pretty well. But are they all horrid? Are you sure they are all horrid? Yes, quite sure, for a particular friend of mine, a Miss Andrews, a sweet girl, one of the sweetest creatures in the whole world, has read every one of them. I wish you knew Miss Andrews, you'd be delighted with her. She is netting herself the sweetest cloak you can conceive. I think her as beautiful as an angel, and I am so vexed with the men for not admiring her. I scold them all amazingly about it. Scold them? Do you scold them for not admiring her? Yes, that I do. There is nothing I would not do for those who are really my friends. I have no notion of loving people by halves. It is not my nature. My attachments are always excessively strong. I told Captain Hunt at one of our assemblies this winter that if he was to tease me all night, I would not dance with him unless he would allow Miss Andrews to be as beautiful as an angel. The men think us incapable of real friendship, you know, and I am determined to show them the difference. Now, if I were to hear anybody speak slightingly of you, I should fire up in a moment. But that is not at all likely, for you are just the kind of girl to be a great favourite with the men. Oh, dear, cried Catherine, colouring. How can you say so? I know you very well. You have so much animation, which is exactly what Miss Andrews wants, for I must confess there is something amazingly insipid about her. 
Oh, I must tell you that just after we parted yesterday, I saw a young man look at you at so earnestly. I am sure he is in love with you. Catherine coloured and disclaimed again. Isabella laughed. It is very true upon my honour, but I see how it is. You are indifferent to everybody's admiration except that of one gentleman who shall be nameless. Nay, I cannot blame you. Speaking more seriously, your feelings are easily understood. Where the heart is really attached, I know very well how little one can be pleased with the attention of anybody else. Everything is so insipid, so uninteresting, that does not relate to the beloved object. I can perfectly comprehend your feelings. But you should not persuade me that I think so very much about Mr Tilney, for perhaps I may never see him again. Not see him again. My dearest creature, do not talk of it. I am sure you would be miserable if you thought so. No, indeed, I should not. I do not pretend to say that I was not very much pleased with him, but while I have Udolpho to read, I feel as if nobody could make me miserable. Oh, that dreadful black veil. My dear Isabella, I am sure that there must be Laurentina's skeleton behind it. It is so odd to me that you should never have read Udolpho before, but I suppose Mrs Morland objects to novels. No, she does not. She very often reads Sir Charles Grandison herself, but new books do not fall in our way. Sir Charles Grandison? That is an amazing, horrid book, is it not? I remember Miss Andrews could not get through the first volume. It is not like Udolpho at all, but yet I think it is very entertaining. Do you indeed? You surprise me. I thought it had not been readable. But my dearest Catherine, have you settled what to wear on your head tonight? I am determined at all events to be dressed exactly like you. The men take notice of that sometimes, you know. But it does not signify if they do, said Catherine, very innocently. Signify? Oh, heavens, I make it a rule never to mind what they say. They are very often amazingly impertinent if you do not treat them with spirit and make them keep their distance. Are they? Well, I never observed that. They always behave very well to me. Oh, they give themselves such airs. They are the most conceited creatures in the world and think themselves of so much importance. By the by, though I have thought of it a hundred times, I have always forgot to ask you what is your favourite complexion in a man. Do you like them best dark or fair? I hardly know. I never thought about it much. Something between both, I think. Brown. Not fair and not very dark. Very well, Catherine. That is exactly he. I have not forgot your description of Mr Tilney. A brown skin with dark eyes and rather dark hair. Well, my taste is different. I prefer light eyes. And as to complexion, do you know, I like a sallow better than any other. You must not betray me if you should ever meet one of your acquaintance answering that description. Betray you? What do you mean? Nay, do not distress me. I believe I have said too much. Let us drop the subject. Catherine, in some amazement, complied, and after remaining a few moments silent, was on the point of reverting to what interested her at that time rather more than anything else in the world, Laurentina's skeleton, when her friend prevented her by saying, For heaven's sake, let us move away from this end of the room. Do you know, there are two odious young men who have been staring at me this half hour. They really put me quite out of countenance. Let us go and look at the arrivals. They will hardly follow us there. Away they walked to the book, and while Isabella examined the names, it was Catherine's employment to watch the proceedings of these alarming young men. They are not coming this way, are they? I hope they are not so impertinent as to follow us. Pray let me know if they are coming. I am determined I will not look up. In a few moments, Catherine, with unaffected pleasure, assured her that she need not be longer uneasy, as the gentleman had just left the pump room. And which way are they gone? said Isabella, turning hastily round. One was a very good-looking young man. They went towards the churchyard. Well, I'm amazingly glad to have got rid of them. And now, what say you to going to Edgar's buildings with me and looking at my new hat? You said you should like to see it. Catherine readily agreed. Only, she added, perhaps we may overtake these two young men. Oh, never mind that. If we make haste, we shall pass them by them presently, and I am dying to show you my hat. But if we only wait a few minutes, there will be no danger of our seeing them at all. I shall not pay them any such compliment, I assure you. I have no notion of treating men with such respect. That is the way to spoil them. 
Catherine had nothing to oppose against such reasoning, and therefore, to show the independence of Miss Thorpe and her resolution of humbling the sex, they set off immediately as fast as they could walk in pursuit of the two young men. That always was one of my most absolute favourite chapters of Jane Austen, and I think it still must be. I, I, you know, I'm a lot older than Isabella now, but I feel like I may have met several Isabellas over the course of my life. Uh, some of them who are also rather a lot older than actual Isabella. Um, she's such a perfectly drawn, totally realistic character. And the thing that I love beyond that is how we see, without being told what we're thinking through the dialogue, we, we see exactly how she is, how Catherine is, the workings of their respective brains. And we also see, I think Isabella's speech is one of the most brilliant speech writing in Austen. Her character is so perfectly described in the type of vocabulary, the way she she uses superlatives, hyperbole, exaggeration, um, continuously, and the way that Catherine, Catherine's own language picks up on it. Everything is the greatest in the world, the sweetest, um, what I want to do more than anything in all the world. And she she repeats these phrases, and it's just so typical of of the way people actually speak in real life, in a, in a sort of affected, exaggerated way. It's just, the characterization is just beyond anything else. It's just sparkling and brilliant and I love it so much and I hope you love it too. Um, anyway, we will leave it there and I hope you have a lovely evening. Good night. <laughs>